Okay, it's day 108 of this honeydew germination experiment. So these vines have gotten quite long, mostly vine number one, but you know, this was just sticking out way over here and I basically decided this morning to kind of push it to, um, you know, go down. So this kink here, it's almost another 90 degree kink, but you know, it was pointing upwards in the morning. So I just kind of shove the whole thing down and these are very flexible I'm not harming the plant um, in fact it's already binding right here to one of these plastic columns so that's working so if you look here the tendril begins here and it's swayed around during the day and basically inbound to this plastic column so there's a lot of give in that it's a giant hairpin and or rather a hairpin is a giant tendril formation or configuration so basically this will bind and I'll make sure these uh, nice leaves and uh, this shoot apical meristem top of the vine stays within a manageable situation I wanted to make a few laps around this entire structure and bind to these plastic columns so I don't have an uncontrollable vine situation going on in my living room. This is the shoot apical meristem of vine 2. It's sticking up due to phototropism. At some point, you know, it's bound the column there. If it becomes unmanageable, I'll just knock it over and try to make it coil clockwise around the pot just like uh, vine number 1. So, you know, you can see a previous coil there. They're kind of meeting together. Um, Here's another connection. So there are multiple connections going on. I think that's an old one. So it's doing very well. It's going upwards, but I'll regulate that if need be. So in addition to providing structural support for these vines and a substrate for the tendrils to bind onto, and a containment system for the vines in general. These support columns can also serve as a moisture monitoring system. So when the sun beats on this pot and the sand uh, all day long, it generates a lot of heat that gets absorbed and it's still very moist. Um, just, you know, even one centimeter down beneath this sand. So the potting mix is moist and these columns are hollow so moisture will rise up and condense so as long as you see this you know the soil is very well watered and you don't need to water anymore plant number three is starting to thrive it's got all these uh, new tree leaves that are getting bigger and bigger and you can still see those little um, vestigial cotyledons I don't know if that's a process common to all meristem regenerations and then you have the shoot apical meristem, which is clearly visible now. It's fuzzy. It's generating, you know, two true leaves each time, or at least two that you can see. And there's a small true leaf there, the first one, that's sort of underdeveloped. Um, but, you know, the petioles are getting bigger now. They're getting longer. So, especially for this one, you know, the petiole is a decent length. It's day 111 of my honeydew germination experiment. So I think it's been 72 hours since I last filmed. And there's been a lot more growth. And because there's so many leaves now for these three vines, you know, any kind of growth will just be accelerated. And basically, it's getting harder and harder to contain these vines within the confines of this pot, despite my best intentions. So let's see. This is vine number one. I made it, you know, basically made a loop all the way around. So it's made two revolutions. And, you know, when this got over there, I kind of, it was kind of growing upwards and I bent that down parallel to the soil and it keeps trying to bounce back up due to phototropism. So every once in a while I gotta redirect it back in. So I'm gonna try to do that now. And, you know, it's just going to get harder and harder to uh, get this thing in check. So, I guess that's the best, you know, I can do it for now. Just try to get it to fall over in some direction. 
because this thing will become a huge unwieldy mess if I allow it to just grow unchecked in any direction. Likewise, Vine 2 is quickly becoming unmanageable. So there are these two long tendrils um, that bound to that. You know, originally it was just shooting up right over here and I kind of suppressed it by bending it over. Um, right now this isn't too tall. But um, let's see. Yeah, basically the problem is it'll just keep trying to go up with phototropism. And, you know, it'll just keep trying to grow in the opposite direction that gravity is applying for. So tendrils have bound all these plastic sport columns. So there are some places with dead leaves. I'm just going to remove them. Here's another example of a dead leaf I got to get rid of. So there still are some leaves that are in the process of dying. I just removed the two that I pointed out. And basically, um, some of them aren't really dying. Well, they just have compromised edges, so to speak. And this leaf just ended up in a really bad position because I filled up a lot more sand in this bowl, you know, a week or two ago. So basically, the petiole, the angles are all wrong, and because of the vine growth, it's being pressed against the ground so it faces physical stress and the edges have basically frayed maybe the plant has detected that you know this is a lost cause and is going to get rid of it at some point and this is a very ugly leaf it's basically dying and yeah I don't want to remove any of these leaves if they have a healthy petiole like this one does because that'll just cause a lot of damage and you know uh, give the plant a chance to be infected by the wound I'm creating. So I pretty much have to resist the urge to just prune left and right and cause damage and interfere with the plant's growth. So here's another angle at which you can observe vine number two. It's binding these plastic spore columns everywhere and that's how it was able to shoot up straight. I tried bending it over and to no avail. You know it's just going to keep trying to do that so at some point this pot is either going to be full of leaves or I'm going to have a real problem on my hands in deciding how to take care of this problem. So last time I discussed how some of these meristems in plant one are no longer suppressed um, but you know this hasn't really developed all that much despite being you know pretty far away from the shoot apical meristem I think you know it's just growing very very slowly and you know, I'm very interested to see if honeydew vines do branch out or do they just go out as one continuous vine. I think at some point they would branch out. So this is vine number three at the regeneration site. So you can see the new pair of cotyledons which are very very small. A first true leaf, you know, second true leaf, third true leaf, fourth true leaf and fifth true leaf along with the sheet apical meristem is just a mess of fuzziness. So you can still see that one very dark green leaf there it's still providing a lot of food for the plant but these new petioles are getting much longer. So ever since I put sand on top of the potting mix I haven't seen as many flies bother this plant. There's a few here and there but you know I think most of my problems came from the potato germination experiment because there was just not enough sand covering all that soil and flies were getting in and out so there's just fungus gnats everywhere these days um, I had to resand the potato plant experiment um, today and I hope that solves the problem or at least greatly reduces it the other worry I have is are they you know sort of coming out of these uh, vents and these plant spas so far I don't really have evidence that they do emerge out from the bottom. I would think that you know they're just genetically programmed to once they metamorphosize into flies basically to come go upwards and burrow out of the soil. It doesn't really make sense for them to you know try to figure out a way by burrowing down especially since they're so small in relation to a pot this big. That would just expend way too much energy and be impossible in a lot of cases such as if there's like bedrock underneath. It's day 114 of this honeydew germination experiment. 
So there are a lot of tendrils whipping around, binding everything in sight. You know, I think at this point, uh, if you check my latest ginger germination experiment uh, episode, you know, I had a problem with underwatering. So I kind of freaked, you know, because all the soil for this uh, in the early days was always so wet and damp and overwatering killed a lot of my plants that plus not getting enough sun and then I had all this trauma you know uh, root transplants and stuff like that so basically I wanted to maintain the status quo because things were going so well but I think it may finally be time to water so here's a leaf that doesn't look too hot and you know I think I'm just underwatering at this point so I'm going to go ahead and water the plant spot tray. So here's the dead petiole that I broke off. And basically here's a marrow stem and this is just a fuzzy ball. It's almost impossible to make out what exactly is going on in there. If we look over from here, you can see two little bumps here. So I'm not quite sure how this works, but you know, I'm not sure this will get triggered anyhow unless the shoot apical marrow stem gets lopped off. So here's the shoot apical marrow stem of plant number one. It's made more than one revolution around this entire pot because I made it so. And look how long the tendrils are now. So you know the leaf primordia, the new true leaves forming, are always kind of on the same scale but the tendrils seem to get longer and longer and if we follow this, uh, this is the less robust vine stem of uh, plant number two now let me get the light a little further away but um, yeah it has a shoot apical marrow stem, very healthy but it's generating these uh, extremely long tendrils so so here's plant number three you can still see that little pair of cotyledons and this is a true leaf. You know, here's another one. The petioles have gotten considerably longer, so this is going upwards. That's great. You know, it's uh, first I kind of joked that it was like a honeydew bonsai, but you know, at least it's growing up straight. It still hasn't fallen on, under over its own weight. So plant three has no intentions of getting rid of this most productive leaf that it's relied on for photosynthesis to get the whole marrow stem regeneration started. So one thing that's bothered me for a while on this project is how there's all these uh, wrinkled leaves. Pretty sure this is not how they're supposed to look. Um, I heard one theory online that you know if there are too many solutes um, just in the sand or soil that basically sucks water out of the leaves and cause them to look like this but uh you know the root ball that I transferred over that contains Lysol and you know the pesticides I actually didn't spray that much at all but you know I sprayed some Lysol on the surface and I gotta believe at this point that the root balls um, the roots for all of these plants all three of them has to be way way deep and extends through the entire you know pot of soil by now so I kinda of find that hard to believe but I haven't watered for a really long time due to paranoia over overwatering so it's been well over a month I wouldn't be surprised if it's been like I don't know like 40 days uh, or even longer so I'm gonna go ahead and water the water tray just like I did recently for the ginger and sweet potato germination experiments so I took this uh, toothpaste packaging material and basically cut off one end to make a plastic trowel and I'm going to use that to aid me in uh, pouring water into this to get it in there more easily. So I have about 475 mLs in this bottle So that's not nearly enough as I demonstrated with the sweet potato watering today. I'm going to need about another 800 mLs or so.
Okay, so I filled up this water tray and you know all that water should be gone, absorbed by the bottom of the soil within 24 hours uh, just like it did for the much smaller 10 inch ginger pot. I had to water the ginger pot again the next day and I probably will have to for this pot as well. When I was replenishing the water reservoirs for my sweet potato germination experiment today um, I basically drowned two flies I think right on camera so there's definitely a benefit to uh, keeping these trays full with water.